Then on May the 10th, our archives collections curator, Diane Barnard, will give a special virtual tour of our temporary women's suffrage exhibit, Justice Not Favor, uh, focusing on the textile pieces that are in the exhibit. You won't want to miss this opportunity to see the, pro the exhibit virtually. Finally, we remind you that Justice Not Favor, Alabama Women in the Vote, is on view at the archives from now until May 31st. And you can find more information about the exhibit and our hours of operation on our website, www.archives.alabama.gov, and on our social media pages. Among the dozens of artifacts uh, on view in Justice Not Favor, our temporary exhibit, are two contemporary paintings by South Alabama artist Seneca Edwards Bush. Those two pieces depict the fight for equality from the perspective of a young African-American female. It is my privilege to welcome you today, our speaker, Seneca Edwards Bush, who is an award-winning self-taught artist born in Pritchard, born and raised in Pritchard, Alabama. Bush is focused on bringing art into the communities of South Alabama through partnerships with groups including the Boys and Girls Club and the Alabama Contemporary Arts Center. She describes her overlapping missions as an artist as, quote, showing color where there is none, helping to cultivate young artists, and letting the art speak what the heart feels. Seneca, welcome. And to begin with, please just start by telling us a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Yes, my name is Seneca Elwes Bush. I was born and raised in Pritchard um, in the county of Mobile. And um, I've been doing art since I was five, as, as far back as I can remember. Um, and I just, I, I love art. It has progressed into more, um, more of a, I guess, professional type, but I love art. I, I recently just got back into art 2017. And after my oldest graduated, she was like, mama, just go do your art. You know, you raised me, I'm fine, go do your art and you gotta start living. So those words just set me on fire. And I just, I just went from there um, praying and, and God just put me on a path and I'm, I'm just, just keep moving. I, I'm just, just doing it, just standing in my lane and just painting from the heart. And um, I'm now the artist in residence at the Alabama Contemporary Art Center. I have a two year program here, which I'll be finished in December of this year with the culmination of my first solo show. So the works that you see behind me and around me, those are pieces that I've been working on for the show. Um, we just finished an art camp here with, with kids and just to, I, I work a lot with kids because I know how it feels to not have your art cultivated. And I know just how important art is with kids. So I try my best to always have my hands in the mix of, of helping cultivate kids and their imagination. And um, yeah, I have a married to uh, Camarcus Bush, my husband, high school sweetheart, have four children, Carrington, Kingston, Lexington and Ellington. And um, yeah, raising them right here in Pritchard. Um, yeah, raising them to be great humans and, and contribute to this world. And uh, yeah, I thank them all the time for, you know, allowing me to be that mama that's away painting and just a lot, just going on this journey with me. I always appreciate and thank them for that because I know it's, 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 it's kind of different, you know, so I appreciate them, my, my, my little support team. Well, that's terrific. Seneca, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. So there's a little bit of a, a ghost in the machine with, with our video, but the audio works. So we're, uh, we're going to, we're going to just proceed. Okay. Uh, and so, well, tell us a little bit uh, about, uh, you, you told us about your, your family, about your husband, your kids growing up in Pritchard. Just talk a little bit about how the history of your family and your community growing up there, how has that influenced the art that you're producing now? Oh, I am learning more and more about um, just the depths of what my art comes from. My dad's parents are from Mississippi. My granddad was from Waynesboro and my grandmother was from Meridian, Mississippi. And I am really, um, I'm really tapping into my Mississippi, my, my, my Mississippi side. It, it's that fight behind it. And my grandfather was very vocal about, you know, the civil rights era and very um, 
he was very, he was a small man, but he was a giant. He was, he, he was literally a giant, but he was very vocal about, you know, just the wrongs, you know, that were done to blacks in Mobile. And um, just to know that they came from Mississippi, it, it, it just, um, I don't know. I'm just tapping into my, like my Mississippi roots. I'm really, really holding on to that. And uh, my dad is an artist as well. He's, he's also a, just a self-taught cabinet maker. So I get a lot of my art and craftiness from my dad as well. And um, I think just knowing that my grandparents were so vocal about, you know, civil rights and the wrongs that were done to blacks in Mobile and Mississippi, I think it just is uh, it's in my DNA to care. It's in my DNA to vocalize. I just vocalize through my paints. Um, yeah, so that's that that plays a that that plays a, a big role in how I how I portray my art. Mm -hmm. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, so what we're going to do now, uh, we're, Sanika, we're going to put up a couple of the images of the two pieces from you that uh, appear in Justice Not Favor. And I um, want you to just tell us a little bit about those. The one that we're looking at now uh, is called uh, what are they saying, Paul? Paul. So tell us, tell us how this piece came about. What it, what it means to you, and and put it in the context of your okay. family's history for us. Okay. Well, this piece I actually created at my dining room table during the pandemic. There was a time where God literally sat me down at my table, and I had to focus. It was my therapy. It was therapy for my kids. We painted literally every day. We painted. So this piece came along, and the little girl in the middle. That's a character named Addie. I call her Addie. And the gentleman on the side of her is her papa. And the woman on the side of her is a, is a grandmama. So you can see papa's shoes. You can see he has literature in his pocket. You can see that he has a belt on. You can see that his, his boots are worn. So he's a working man. You can see grandma on the side with her patent leather shoes on, church shoes on. You can see Addie with her little doll. You can see Addie dressed up. You can also see the people in the background that have their signs, and you also see the literature that's on the ground. To me, in my imagination, and me, you know, trying to transport myself in that time, I just see a little girl who was always interested in what was going on. You know, to be a five or six year old living in that time, it must have been, you know, amazing and terrifying at the same time because. You see your parents and grandparents getting ready for a march. You don't really know what's going on, but you see how dedicated and how ter maybe terrified, but how strong and how courageous they were to go out and do these marches. And you also see the literature. You know, back in those days, I, I imagine that literature was so important, you know, handing out flyers, handing out, you know, just different things to read. There's little, little bit of pieces of knowledge that were handed out to people as in, in the community as they were preparing for, you know, a march. So that's how this piece came along. Um, I'm not sure what was going on. It's, it's been so much going on with, you know, racial, you know, unjust in the U.S. today. I'm not sure what was happening at the exact moment that I painted this this particular piece. But Addie, the little girl in, in the in the center in the pink dress, she just represents just so many children that grew up in that era, you know, just seeing their parents rush out, seeing their dads, you know, meet with other dads and other young men in the community, to try to protect the community at the same time. It just must, I don't know, it just must have been just an amazing, terrifying time. To, to live and witness what, what she witnessed. Absolutely. Let's move on to the second piece that we have, uh, and then I'll, I'll talk a little about how these two fit into the other pieces that are that are in that portion of the exhibit. But this is Take Me to the March, Daddy. And this is, uh, of the two, this is my personal favorite. And uh, I, this one really brings a lot to the exhibit, I think. And so tell us about this piece and your inspiration for it. Okay, this piece, um, again, came to me at my dining room table, and you can see all of the women, the teenagers, and you see a family unit that were going out to march. You also see um, it's a clergyman in there somewhere, but you just see this a group of people, a group of brown people just marching for just simple things. You know, you have a sign that says, I am a man, we are equal. 
Um, I have rights. I can read. God sees, love all. And you also have the one sign that's blank. So that one sign that's blank can transcend from years and decades, you know, down, which is sad, but true. So that sign can be very relevant to today on what you know, Blacks have to go through in the U.S. and across the world. So you can fill in what you want that sign to be, you know, as, as whatever march you want to be a part of. You can also see the dad who has on the green jacket, he has his son on his shoulders. Because for me, just imagine how I would have been in that march. I would, wanted to, I would have wanted to be on my dad's shoulders as well to see, you know, to take it all in, to be a part of it. So... That's why I put the little boy on top of his dad's shoulders. You can also see the two little girls in front. There's Addie again with her baby doll. And there's a story behind the baby doll as well. But you can see Addie with her baby doll. You also see her sister, her older sister, that has a sign as well. So it was a family unit, you know, that were going out participating in these marches. So that's what, that's what we have here. And the small, small detail is that every woman in the march has on a set of pearls because to me just imagining back you know in a march it was so important you know you wanted to not just look your best but just feel like you were you were a part of something that was that was happening and you wanted to just give it your all so it can be a march after church on a sunday it can be a march on a friday but you wanted to look your best and you were serious about it but all i gave all the women pearls all of them all the women have pearls and um, that was just a little detail that I just I, I wanted to wanted to add in there because my grandmother always, you know, had on jewelry or, you know, she was just amazing. But I wanted to give every woman in this painting a set of pearls. It's such an interesting feature. And it's very, like you said, it's so appropriate for what we know about about the movement and, and what that meant to so many people who were going out and marching. But also, uh, as you said, with the, the blank uh, sign in the middle, I think is so evocative and, uh, and is really a, a nice feature. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to put up uh, uh, another image that shows these two uh, together. And one of the reasons to do this is to uh, talk about the context in which we look at uh, these two paintings of Seneca's. Uh, this portion of the exhibit is uh, in a section that we uh, sort of looked at in, in terms of a quote from Amelia Boynton Robinson, uh, of course, known for, uh, for the Selma uh, Dallas County voting rights uh, efforts and of course the Selman Montgomery March and the, the quote that's just to the right of this case says that rights uh, afforded to us in the U.S. Constitution meant little unless we could claim them and so this entire section we talk about sort of claiming uh, the rights and the role of, that black women played historically in the civil rights movement. Uh, in the top portion of this case we feature uh, a couple of artifacts from Betty Anderson, who is a textile artist and uh, a, uh, a public historian in Camden. Uh, and Sonique, I'll get you to talk about uh, Betty in a moment if you'd like. But of course, we have a shoe that uh, young Betty uh, Anderson wore during the Selma and Montgomery March in 65. And then around uh, your first piece in the middle of the case, we have some political buttons from uh, Gwen Patton, who was an activist here in Montgomery. And then on the bottom, we, of course, have the, the larger piece, uh, Take Me to the March. But next to it, uh, there, and Alex, if you want to go to that next slide. Yeah. So next to it, we have, of course, a 1966 photograph of a woman voting in Montgomery. And next to that, we have uh, a demonstration voting machine. And so all of these things, of course, work together to tell these important stories of claiming the rights that are afforded to uh, to all people in the United States Constitution. So uh, let's back up a second. I know uh, by uh, by chance, uh, Seneca, just a couple of months ago, you were able to meet Betty Anderson. Uh, yes. bit of, uh, bit of kismet there. So uh, feel free to tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Yeah, so I I have been you know exploring all things art. Um, while being here at the art center and just, you know, just trying to get into so much, um, so much art and just surrounding myself with arts and art festivals. And I came across the Kentuck Art Festival and I was like, oh, I'm going, I, I, I'm, I'm going to this. So me and my husband packed up and 
took the back rows and made it up there. And I'm just walking through and just like in complete awe. I got to meet um, the ladies from G's Ben and their quilts. And I'm just making my rounds. And lo and behold, in the middle of a little breezeway and she was sitting in the chair, pine straw on the, on the ground. And I'm looking, I passed by and she had on a hat and a jean jacket. So I passed by and I'm like, that can't be her. Cause I had on a mask. I think she had on one. And I was like, that, that, that can't be her. It's, it's, it's not, that's not the lady. And I passed by and I just walked by casual again and made a circle. And I was like, oh, that's her. So my husband was like, that's who? And I was like, that's the lady from Montgomery. That was the pretty lady. That was from Montgomery. She took a picture by my picture, by my painting. And I was like, I gotta go say something to her. So I was like, are you Miss 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 Betty? And she was like, Yes. And I was like, I'm so happy to meet you. I was like, I, I my painters are in Montgomery. You took a picture. And she was like, Honey, we've been looking for you. What's your name? And I was like, Sanika. She was like, Yeah, we've been looking for you. We were just talking about you. And I was like, Oh, she was so nurturing and so. I was so happy to meet her. Yeah, I took a picture. Asked her, can I take a picture? She was like, Yeah. So we took pictures, and she was. She was amazing. She was, uh, she was just amazed. I think she was assembling something, and she was sitting down. She was, she had something in her hands. But yeah, that was, that was, that was a great, 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 great moment for me to actually meet her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, it was so so interesting that that that, that happened, and to watch <laughs> that to watch that unfold on social media, which of course you know is is how we we came to learn about about you and. and your art through uh, too through a, a through a mutual friend mm -hmm. uh, on social media. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, especially in the pandemic, it's uh, it's it's been great to mm -hmm. be able to connect with people that way. Uh, I want to shift a little bit and talk about some of your other uh, artwork, and we've got some examples to show. You know, a lot of your your paintings, uh, Seneca, they have a strong connection to civil rights history, including mm -hmm. your uh, your two. Uh, homages to Gordon Parks' 1956 photographs of Alabama, mm -hmm. uh, your depiction of Freedom Riders. Uh, I'd like you to just, if you if you would, starting with the Parks photo or Parks okay. pieces, just talk a little bit about these works, really, and about uh, more broadly, sort of history as as a muse, really. Okay. Uh, history as a muse for artistic expression, if you could. Okay, this um, this painting here, I saw the photo and fell in love with the photo. And but when I saw the photo, I was like, it's it's so it's so strong, but it's so soft and delicate because you can see her slip strap is hanging off her shoulder, and that's the title of my painting. It's called Slip Strap. You know, just to see this woman dressed so beautifully in the little girl. I used to dress like that when I was a little girl with the ruffle socks and you know, the pretty dresses, my mom would dress us like that. So just to have that connection too with the little girl, but the woman again, she has on pearls, she has on earrings, she has a little clutch, you know, she has on her little pumps. And, but just to have the daintiness of her slip strap to just be hanging ever so lightly just off her shoulder, that that little detail just took me in, you know. Yes, I see the cold entrance sign, you know, just to like ice it, but after all that, here she is standing underneath the sign to, you know, to make her feel less than, but she has a little dainty strap. She's still a woman. She's still a lady. You know, she's, she's still, she's, she's a human, but to try to diminish her, to make her enter around the back, the side of the building. But here you can clearly see that she's a woman. You can clearly see that she's valuable. You can clearly see that she's a human. So just to see the harshness above her head, but still have just the reality of her, you know, being beautiful and dainty, a woman, that that just, yeah. And to, to, to make it so full circle and to make it so, you know, just, just so, so godlike, just, just so godly, the building, the space that I'm sitting in today, I'm actually feet away from this scene. Um, my daughter has actually taken a photo on the same steps that's that's behind this this um, this door. The handrail is still there. Um, you can still see where the sign was actually bolted to the brick. It's it's still there. So Conti Street holds a lot of history in Mobile. It it a lot happened on Conti Street, and to just be residing in a space 
where I get to create a painting. I get to, you know, be a part of Kanta Street. That means a lot to me. I mean, every day I'm, I'm grateful and I'm honored to be here to add a little bit more history to Kanta Street, to, you know, to just give Mobile just something extra to be on Kanta Street, to be steps away from this exact, mm -hmm, from that exact image, from that space is steps away from my building. So when I'm walking to get, you know, a soda or just walking to take a break, I, yeah, I always stop and, and admire that, that spot, always. But this painting, I did again, just, and my, I don't know what was going on. It's, and and it's, it's, that's, you know, a whole other, you know, branch off the tree as well. But just, you know, to sit down and paint this image. You know, I, I, I can't remember what headspace I was in, but I knew I just, I had to do it. I had to, to give my take on it some kind of way. And all my paintings are done in acrylic and I just did like a light acrylic wash on this one. And again, I do faceless images. So you'll see on this one as well, the image, they, they don't have any facial features. So you won't see eyes or lips or a pronounced nose. I keep all of my image fa images faceless. who um, who aren't as familiar with the with the photo that that we were just talking about and the, the story behind it that of course is uh, Conti Street uh, in downtown Mobile and this is the uh, the segregated entrance to the Sanger theater uh, and uh, the space where Seneca's studio is at the Contemporary Art Center is just across the street uh, before we move to the to the next image Seneca I think uh, memory serves you uh, you have another connection to art and Conti Street uh, that was where you uh, you did the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, chalk mural uh, yes. a couple of months well, a couple of years ago now I guess correct yes Yes. Yes. A lot has happened on Conti Street. <laughs> a lot has happened yeah. Yeah. on the street. Mm -hmm. So, of course, this this photo, uh, iconic photo that this uh, takes the inspiration from uh, comes from Life magazine shoot that Gordon Parks uh, participated in in 1956. So the next image that we have is sort of an homage to Parks's Alabama photos from 1956 and shows sort of a uh, a snapshot of a, a few of those that that have become really uh, really popular in demonstrating the as as the story said the restraints the open and hidden restraints of segregation in the south so uh this one's a little different uh Sanika. Mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about this and and uh why you chose to to do it in this fashion and uh one of the one of the things that makes it different is we see a little bit of uh of parks's face here too mm -hmm. Well, this one, um, I went in, I wanted to just get the key, well, not key images, but just put images from Alabama around him. And I wanted him to be the center, but in black and white and let all the other images be in color, as you see. Um, and he's famous, you know, just getting behind that, that camera, you know, just how he held it and how intimate he was with the camera to just zoom in and, and be able to capture all these images that are, you know, forever, forever, you know, famous for the South. Um, at the we'll make our way around. At the top, you'll see the two little boys, one little black boy and one little white boy. And they're they're from the same community. They're from the same, you know, area. And then the very back, you'll see his little sister, you know, peeking out the window. So they're actually uh, playing like, maybe like cops and robbers or something, but they had little, little handguns that they were playing with outside. So I have that image. And below those little boys, it's also another little boy that's leaning against the do not cross uh, barricade. Um, I'm thinking, it, I'm guessing it was a march that he was a part of. And if you come on down, you'll see a little boy, another famous image, you'll see a little boy just sitting in the field and he has band-aids on his head. And with, of course the overalls on. And again, you'll see the little girls at the bottom. They're actually looking into a park that they, a playground that they weren't able to go in. And so you just see them, um, just outside looking in, I th that may have been the name of that actual shot, outside looking in, but you'll see those little group of kids just, just looking like forbidden. I mean, you want to go in, but you, you can't. And you can just in the background of that one, you see um, the white kids and white families in the back playing, 
And above that image is the white only water fountain and another well-dressed lady who could not use that water fountain. And above her um, is the ice cream stop. So um, that was actually the colored side that they had to be served from. So that's a dad, a little girl, and two little boys. And another interesting part for um, for this piece is I actually had a conversation with the little boy in the back with the red shirt on. And he told me all about that day. And we talked and he was, he was so, I was so excited to talk to him. And he told me all about how Gordon Parks would just come to the house and he just, you know, just be casually sitting out, just taking pictures and he'd go to church with them and snap pictures or downtown and snap pictures. And so to speak to him and get this firsthand on how it was to be a kid and have this man, you know, taking pictures of your family all day. He, he said it was just like everyday life. It was just, you know, they didn't, it was just, it was normal. It was, it wasn't a big thing, but, and he said, he didn't know that the images would be this popular and this famous, but um, that, that piece, I really, really, really love this piece. And again, this one is in acrylic and it's about um, 30 by 40 in size, 30 inches by 40 inches in size. It's so interesting. And, and, you know, you're, you're right that, uh, you know, we, we see these today and, and one of the, the geniuses of, of Parks rendering these photos in 1956 in color was to show that it was, you know, something that was that was happening. You know, it was lived experience uh, for so many African-Americans throughout the throughout the country, particularly in the South. But, uh, you know, for for your parents and for your grandparents, especially, I mean, this was this was the mobile of their formative years and so it's, it's so interesting to me that it that it comes back to us now not only in the discovery of gordon parks's photographs but also uh through art by by people such as yourself as well so uh before we move on to the freedom rides i think it's a good uh good moment to stop here and ask a question from uh one of our audience members on facebook liddell stallworth what has inspired you the most uh, to paint historical pieces. Uh, hey, LaDale Stallworth. <laughs> what has inspired me the most with the historical pieces is that I don't want that part of history to be forgotten. You know, I, I cringe when people just try to overlook it or try to sweep it on the rug or just discount them. I, I, I cringe when I hear, I, I just cringe it's because it had to take this era to get to the next step and the next step. So we, we can't just act like it didn't happen. We can't just overlook the marches, the protests, you know, all the other hateful, demeaning things. We can't overlook that. We can't sugarcoat it. We, we, we have to address it. We have to make it relevant, that they're gonna stay relevant. And um, if that's my duty, as the great Nina Simone said, it's my duty as an artist to right. do that. That is my duty. That has been my motto in painting these images. It is my duty as an artist to do that. If I was a singer, I would I would write songs about it. If you know, if I were anything else, I would. It would be my duty to do that. It is it it is my God given talent. I do it with all authority, and I stand behind it. And I do not. I've said in, in the speech, <laughs> I was crying, but I got it out. I do not paint to offend anyone. I paint to offend the hate that lies within you. If you get offended, that's your hate coming out. That's, I, I'm sorry, but not sorry. I do not paint intentionally to offend anyone. I paint to educate you. I paint to bring things to the surface and I paint to make sure my history, your history and American history is relevant. We're not gonna just go plant daisies and flowers and roses and not look at the soil in which it came from, okay? We're not gonna do that. So it is my duty to paint what I know, what I feel. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, the hands get to move. No, <laughs> you know. 
Uh, so tell us uh, the next photo that we want to show uh, will be familiar to our viewers today because it is directly behind you. Uh, this is mm -hmm. a, a wonderful uh, evocative piece showing some of our uh, well-known freedom riders. So tell us a little bit about this one. And of course, yes. we all recognize the person in the top left yes. corner, I think. Mm -hmm. That piece is there right behind me. <laughs> they reside in my studio as of now. Um, Still waiting for God to move them around where they need to be. But again, I painted this piece in my living room. So that's a 40 by 60 canvas. I sat it in my lap and drew out each person and proceeded with caution and authority. And I got that image on the canvas. This is um, just a grouping of mug shots from the Freedom Riders. And the more I researched and, you know, kind of just dove into the history, there were hundreds. And I was like, oh my God, if I could paint all of them, give me the strength, Lord, to paint them. But this particular grouping, I just found so interesting. You have the famous John John Lewis there. You have an older gentleman, older white gentleman next to him. You have um, a younger lady next to him. She actually um, lives, she's from Birmingham, Tarrant County, the last that I heard. You have an older white woman as an ally that was on the Freedom Rider bus. And just row by row, all these different people all fighting for the same thing. You know, you gotta have your allies, but in, in this this in this particular just grouping, you have all these different people, all different backgrounds, but the common denominator, freedom, the rights, you know, getting on that bus, riding, you know, protesting, marching, boycotting, whatever they could do to get the message across. And it took me about a good two weeks to get this one done. Yeah, about a good two weeks. Um, yeah, I, this is one of my one of my absolute favorites. One of my absolute favorites. Mm -hmm. It's really great. I, I, I remember watching this one come to life on your, on your social media, and uh, it was great. So uh, it's a good time for us to pause for a moment and invite any of our viewers. If you have a question for our artist, Seneca Edwards-Bush, just drop that in the comments. We will get to those, uh, another round of those in just a moment. But uh, also a good time for us to say that you can find Seneca uh, on both Facebook and Instagram. Just type right. in her name and she will come up. You'll see some more of her material there. Uh, uh, I think a, a broad question here, uh, Seneca, but but one I think that's very pointed to the uh, to the moment that we're in. Uh, how do you think art helps us heal? Art helps us heal because you can feel it, you can see it. And when I say feel it, that's both, you know, tangible. I can touch it. But with my art, it's so different to see it in person. When you see it in person, you will feel it. If you get the same connection I get, then we're like minded. But to see art in person, they do speak to you. You know, they because even if I do the just the faces images, you tend to wonder who they are, who they were, who they will be. You can see yourself. You can see your child. You can see your grandparents. You can see so many people in these particular images. So art, it helps us heal. It, it brings color to the conversation. I think it, it, it just brings it just right there in your face, just, just right there in your face. You can't, <laughs> close the book on. It's, it's just right there in your face. So I think art, you know, however big, however small, I, it helps you heal. When you can see it and you can see it being interpreted in so many different ways by so many different artists, but to get, you know, a connection with one artist or one piece from that artist, that's how you begin to heal. And it also opens up dialogue for you to talk about it. Um, and that's, that's my mission. That's, you know, that's my mission. Absolutely. Uh, let's put up on the screen now, uh, Seneca, a final piece that we want to get you to uh, to talk about. And uh, when we were preparing for this program, well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm one ahead of. So tell us about this piece here as well. This is a, a sort of a, a sister piece to the two that we have on view in Justice Not Favor, I think. Correct? Mm -hmm. This one is entitled He's Not a Bad Doggy. And the little girl, once again, 
has her baby doll. And I'll talk about the background. You see the images of the, the people in the background, how it's kind of faded out, but you have people running. You have people running up, you know, to the march, away from the march. You see the signs that are on the ground. You see little tethered pieces of clothing. You see ripped clothing in the background. You see the dog has a piece of ripped clothing under his paw. And you see the little girl that has on a red dress. Addie had on the pink dress, but this particular painting with the red dress is about Bloody Sunday. So that's why her dress is red. And you see the dog, he doesn't have any facial features as well. You also see him on a leash. So the story with the doll and the dog, her daddy told her to take the dog with her to the march because if the dogs attack you, you throw them your doll. They'll go for the doll and not your legs. So that's why she has that. That doll is so important to her. It's so important that she took that doll with her to that march. And with the dog, you see, he has a leash, but the leash isn't hanging. Somebody's actually holding him by the leash. So is that going to make you wonder if the officer holding him, was he really there to cause harm for the march? You know, did he tell the dog to be still or did the dog just sit? So it kind of gets you to wondering, like, who's on the other side of that leash? Because I'm quite sure, you know, it was a cop there that just had to think this is not right. Like, you had to think this is not right. What we're doing is not right. It's not, not lawful. So that's to just get the viewer to think, who's holding on to that dog? Did they tell that dog to stay or did that dog just refuse? to do that command to attack. So that's that's my take on that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's another another beautiful piece. Uh, I want to show another one now that uh, that I was unfamiliar with until we started uh, mm -hmm. talking about the the prep for this program. So mm -hmm. tell us about this and then we'll get to a few additional viewer questions if you don't mind. Yes, this is a painting I did to um, to just focus on voting rights. And it's called, it's, the title is Ballot Box. So this one, again, you'll see images faded in the background. Those are people who, who passed on. And the whole image is actual people who passed on, but just a line of people standing in line to vote. You know, at the front of the line, you see, of course, Harriet Tubman. Behind her, you see an, an elderly woman on her walker with her patent leather purse, her patent leather shoes, her pearl earrings, her gray hair full of wisdom, you know, her white stockings on, but she's in line to vote. You know, no, it doesn't matter her ailment, she's in line to vote. You see Addie amongst all these people around her, you see Addie still standing in the middle with her doll. And beside her is Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who had passed on at this point, she had passed on, but she's standing in line. And behind her, John Lewis, He's standing there with that little dog because he's also known, you know, all the images of him, you know, those famous shots of him at the Selma March. So you, you see that same canine, that same German Shepherd next to him. And you see all the other people behind them, um, the, 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 the ladies, the older, the teenagers, you know, the, the elderly man in the back. And of course, you see it, the guy that's, that's, that's been hung. So again, it's not to offend you, it's just to offend the hate that lies within you. So this is a, a conversation piece. You can talk about it, dissect it, discuss it, but this is what it is. You have people that went through all of this just to vote, you know, being hanged, being, you know, everything just to vote. So I don't take voting lightly. It's very, very serious to vote. Um, you'll see also under Harriet Tubman's feet, you see cotton. So I put cotton there and you'll see behind her, the little um, red things on the, the ground. Those are rose petals, rose petals. And those do represent the, the, the bloody Sunday. So I put the red rose petals on the ground underneath the other, um, other, three, Im uh, other three people. And Sonika, when did you paint this piece? Is this a more recent this, piece? This one was, I think in 20, 2021, I think. Gotcha. That piece is here at the studio, too. I think it was 2021. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, Addie, I ask because, uh, you know, it, it seems to me that, that Addie's growing up a little bit. Yes. So, uh, yes she's getting a little taller. <laughs> and uh, so we'll be able to, over the course of several years, we'll be able to watch Addie grow up uh, yeah. in, your, in your pieces. So mm -hmm. uh, before we get to a couple more audience questions, uh, one thing comes to mind. We, we've, talked, we've asked you about inspiration mm -hmm. uh, through history, but, you know, obviously your artistic choice to do uh, d depict uh, people without faces uh, has a long history in, in folk art tradition. So tell us about some of the artists who have inspired you during your career. Ooh, oh my goodness, I got a list. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I am teaching. I, I'm teaching myself, and I'm you know doing a lot of research on black artists because growing up I didn't know a lot of black artists, yeah. and now. I am just so, just so, just into um, Faith Ringo, Betty Sarr. I love Kadir Nelson. I've been a fan of his since yeah. forever. I love, love, love Kadir Nelson. Um, what other artists? Oh gosh, oh gosh, it's so many, it's so many. But um, in my paintings, I don't do the, oh, and, um, oh goodness, Jacob Lawrence. Love mm -hmm. Jacob Lawrence's sure. stuff. I got a chance to see some of his books on exhibit in Miami. I went to Soul Basel in Miami. And yeah, I was like, ah, I see, I thought it said exhibit. So I'm just learning about all these black artists that I didn't know about. You know, I was taught about Picasso and um, Van Gogh and Matisse, I, you know, they're they're in books, but I didn't know any black artists. So I it's my mission to learn about these black artists and share these black artists, living and non-living with all the kids that I encountered because I wanted to be a wide variety of artists. And my type of art, I call it skin folk, kin folk art because I can't technically say I'm a folk artist because I am. I went to art school mm -hmm. and I, I'm self-taught as well, but I did right. have training, you know, throughout school. So I just call my style skin folk, kin folk art. And I do add different shading to where you can, it's an implied eye or it, it's an implied sure. level, but right. You know, you just it, it just draws you in, you know, yes. it's just you sit and you look and you wonder. And like sometimes I've been in the studio and I'm just painting. I just said, OK, it looks like an eye, but it's not an eye. It's just like once your hands get to moving and yeah, you just just paint and they they, they, they come to life. You almost forget that there are no eyes because you're so connected in other ways. You forget it's, it's no lips, no nose, no eyes. It's just all around feeling, you know, to see them in person is, yeah, they just kind of pull you in. Right. Well, it's like that, it's like that blank, uh, 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 protest sign in your, in your piece that we have on view, you know, you, you imprint on that, what you, what you bring to, the, mm -hmm. to the viewing. And I think mm -hmm. that's so interesting. We have a question now from, uh, Hayden McDaniel, one of our colleagues here at the Department of Archives and History. She says, beautiful pieces. Thank you for sharing. What are some other historical moments you would still like to capture in your art? Oh, thank you so much. So what's coming up next? Thank yeah. you. Um, what's coming up next? Oh, it's it's so much. It is so much. Um, oh my God, it's it's so much. I I don't know what's coming up next. Um, but it can be, it can be a thought. It can be a, a like. I watch a lot of APT too. <laughs> like I'll catch something, just sit there, like oh my God, it's like Alabama. It's so much in Alabama that I can paint about. Oh my God. Um, but once again, I'm also tapping into my Mississippi side. So sure. like Mississippi mud, I want to use that, that mm. orange color. I want to, you right. know, paint sweet potatoes. I want to, I want to paint so much. It's they're all in there. It just takes a conversation to spark it or, <laughs> you know, it just, but it's, it's so, it's so much history in Alabama. It's so it's so much history in Alabama, and I don't think we would ever move forward until we put it on the table. We sit it on the table, we eat it, digest it, and really get into it. Um, it's so much content. It, it's it's so much content out there to paint. But um, I think I want to I want to continue with. Um, I may do something about. The 16th Street bombing. I may do another piece. I have uh, pieces of the four little girls, um, but I may I may go a little deeper into that. 
I may do something about, um, I may tap into a little bit more of the Freedom Riders, but backing up to the Aniston bus station. So I may do something dealing with the Aniston bus station and how they bombed. I saw that on APT and was like, oh my goodness. It was, yeah, we have, I, I have a lot of content, sad to say, you know, that I can pull from, but I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I, I'm definitely going to get more pieces. Well, Sanika Edwards Bush, we will uh, we will look forward to uh, looking over your proverbial shoulder and uh, seeing, <laughs> seeing as these uh, these new works uh, continue to come out. And uh, thank you for uh, for loaning us the two images that uh, that are, appear in Justice Not Favor. And uh, just as a reminder to our audience, you can see those two pieces of our artists uh, in person here at the Department of Archives and History at our temporary exhibit, Justice Not Favor, Alabama Women in the Vote, which is on view in our changing gallery on the second floor through the end of May. So thank you again to our guests today, and thank you all for watching. We'll see you again soon. Be well. Thank you.